Hawaii's election season is about to heat up. Voters will be electing a new governor and every seat in the state house and senate are up for grabs. We don't yet know all the candidates who are running, but we do know many will be representing several political parties. We're inviting representatives from all of them to tell us what they stand for and why you should consider their candidates. Tonight's live broadcast and live stream of insights on PBS Hawaii start now. Aloha and welcome to Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Yanji Denise. 2022 is a big year for local politics and voters will be tasked with electing officials who have an impact on their day-to-day -day lives. The primary election is set for August 13th with the general to follow on the 8th of November. More than 80 races this year will feature partisan candidates. They include U.S. Senate and House seats, governor and lieutenant governor, and every seat in the Hawaii State Legislature. Tonight we'll be learning more about Hawaii's political parties in order to get you ready to vote. We look forward to your participation in tonight's show. You can email or call in your questions, and you'll find a live stream of this program at pbshawaii.org and on the F PBS Hawaii Facebook page. Now to our guest, who we will introduce in alphabetical order. Jocelyn Costa is the chair of the Aloha Aina Party. She's a graduate of Kamehameha School and currently resides on Maui. After a long career in sales, which included owning a tea leaf farm, she retired in January. Lynn Finnegan, is the chair of the Hawaii Republican Party. She served in the state legislature for eight years and was the House Minority Leader for four of those years. She was also a candidate for lieutenant governor in 2010. Zooming in from Wailuku, Maui tonight is Ed Gassman, chair of the Hawaii Constitution Party. He's a Vietnam-era veteran and is an advocate for veterans suffering from PTSD and the homeless. He's also an ordained minister. Also from Maui, Sylvia Litchfield from the Green Party of Hawaii. She's volunteered for the party since 2016 and is currently the membership chair. Zooming in from Upper Puna tonight is Shannon Matson, vice chair of the Democratic Party of Hawaii. Prior to this role, she was the vice chair for Hawaii Island Democrats. She's a yoga instructor and a mom of two. And Eric Weiner has been a member of the Libertarian Party since 1978 and is the treasurer for the Hawaii chapter. He's recently retired after a 40-year career in agriculture on Hawaii Island and is the president of the Hawaii Papaya Industry Association. A lot of biographies to get through and a lot to talk about tonight. We appreciate you all being here. I want to give viewers a sense of the parties that you each represent. So let's start in that same order and very briefly, if you could give us a sense of the party that you're representing tonight. Jocelyn, we'll start with you. Um, mahalo for this opportunity, PBS, to be able to introduce the Aloha Party to those in, in our great state of Hawaii. Uh, the Aloha Party is, as I, I consider it, the oldest party here. Even if we've only now emerged, it's been here since 1898 when the Hui Aloha Aina brought the people together in Hawaii, um, created a sense of voting, which was for the anti-annexation at the time. And they, they were unanimous in, in their efforts and, and their, um, their patriotic um, um, love for this land. So the Aloha Aina party is of that same uh, theme, which is to bring the people together, to have a united stand, and to really look at what Hawaii needs. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Lynn, let's go to you to talk about the Republican Party. We're obviously familiar, especially at the national level, but tell us about the Hawaii Republican Party. Uh, well, this year, uh, for this election cycle more especially, we adopted a slogan, and it's uh, Stand for Hawaii. It's about putting Hawaii first. And, you know, we're, our people, uh, our members in the Hawaii Republican Party are very active in issues that pertain to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that very fundamental um, part of our constitution. Uh, we also, what we're seeing, especially over the last two years, is people who are people who are about individual rights, about, you know, freedom, about family, um, and even faith, you know, and, and our constitution. So I'd like to hear a little bit more about Ed, you know, who is also part of the constitutional uh, constitution party. 
Um, and, and this year, even too, with the assaults on parental rights, with the assaults on uh, uh, businesses uh, within our communities and at the state capitol, uh, the Republican Party is really about giving the opportunity, the fair opportunity for everyone with not uh, determining equality of outcomes. And so, um, you know, it really depends on the individual to be motivated and to uh, help the community and to be a part of uh, the government process. And this past year, we've been seeing a lot of uh, a lot of people coming out of the woodwork wanting to participate in the Hawaii Republican Party for these values, uh, more especially because of the corruption that has been taking place, uh, because of the, you know, the circumventing of our political process by having an emergency order that has been in for two years. Um, so it's just a lot of, uh, our party is really about hearing the voices of people from all the different spectrums of the people of Hawaii, not just a certain, uh, a certain one party system. Well, Ed, let's go to you because you your party is uh, on the conservative side. What what tell us about the Constitution Party and what does make it different from the Republican Party? Actually, the Constitution Party started out under the name of a U.S. Taxpayers Party back in 1992-93, but however, in 1999, the the name was changed to the Constitution Party to reflect more on the uh, on, on the basic values of this party. And we are the fifth largest polit political party in the United States. And of course, our goal is to, to restore American jurisprudence to its constitutional foundation. And uh, it's our platform is uh, shaped by the constitution of course but but it for the principle is shaped by principles set forth by the declaration of independence bill of rights and of course the bible mm -hmm. and so we uh we we do have uh we consider it the three pillars of the party which is one integrity we believe that uh uh, uh we should be not only be people of integrity, but also accountability and honesty. And second is liberty, liberty. We believe strongly in liberty. We believe that uh, government today, I mean, it's, it's bloated, it's uh, inefficient, it's excessively, incredibly uh, non-functional, in my opinion, of course. And of course, the third, the third part would be the prosperity. We believe in uh, true capitalism. We believe in small businesses, that small businesses are the foundation of our country. And because as, as we encourage uh, 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 small businesses to flourish, they also create jobs for the community and for the nation. Sylvia, let's hear from you and tell us about the Green Party. Thank you, Yanji. Aloha. Uh, the Green Party of Hawaii does not take corporate or I should say big money donations. So we are free to stay true to our values and be a spokesperson for some ideals and ideas that sometimes the major parties would rather overlook. Um, we're a grassroots organization. We're local, we're autonomous, and we're all volunteers. <laughs> Uh, we base our platform on four core values, and that is ecological wisdom, grassroots democracy, social and economic justice, and peace. And we also happen to be a, a decentralized worldwide movement where we're seeking to put the people and the planet before short-term profits and not just have a short-sighted goal in mind, but to see into the future so that we can pass along our resources to our future generations. 
Thank you. Shannon, let's go to you. When we talked about, uh, at the intro, talking about the dominant party, of course, we were referring to the Democrats. Our viewers are undoubtedly familiar with your party. But how would you describe it uh, to folks who may be entering, you know, approaching politics for the first time or casual voters? How do you sum up the Democratic Party? Mahalo, Yanji. Um, and all of, I wanted to say thank you too to all of the PBS Hawaii Insights team for having us all here today to have this important discussion. Um, actually, the Democratic Party formed in 1900 uh, post quarantine, which of course we're all familiar with now um, for a plague at the time and directly in support um, for Queen Lili Okalani. Um, and really the organization of Democrats then was a direct response to the Reform Party and the Republican Party at the time. Um, who was the, the party in power and remained in power for many years. Um, it wasn't until the Democratic Revolution in um, 1954 when the Democratic Party was truly able to rise up against the Big Five through organization and union, unionization of the plantation workers and laborers. Um, and that was when the Democratic Party, uh, party of Hawaii was truly able to start to step into a position of political power. Um, currently, we have 80,000, over 80,000 active and enrolled Democrats. And as you can imagine, with such a large membership, we have many diverse views and priorities within our party. Overall, I see us as a party of inclusivity, and our platform and resolutions reflect that. Um, part of the success of our party is the, the work we do at the grassroots level and how um, many of our members can choose to get involved and participate in different issues they feel passionate about. Uh, for example, over the pandemic, our Democrats in Hawaii Island um, were able to organize a couple of large food distributions for vulnerable families in need, as well as to help with mass drives and test distributions. Um, overall, the Democratic Party here stands for liberty, social, economic justice, protection of the environment, and respect for the dignity and worth of each individual. Okay, and Eric, let's let's go to you last. Um, we heard from Ed and from Lynn about the principles of their party, which tend to be conservative and perhaps could echo some of the things that I would imagine a libertarian would stand for. But tell us a little bit about the Libertarian Party and how it's a different conservative party from those other two. Yeah, thank you for the opportunity to share tonight. Uh, we believe that the Libertarian Party is is mainstream. We share the, the values of the majority of American people in that we're financially responsible and socially inclusive. Uh, we support the Constitution of the United States of America and the Bill of Rights. We therefore strongly support free speech, oppose uh, censorship in any way. Uh, we support the right to bear arms and the belief that individuals own their own bodies, not the government. You know, the only requirement for membership in the Libertarian Party is to renounce violence or force to achieve their political aims. Um, we believe that uh, government has a limited role, and that is to guarantee the rights and freedoms of individuals so long as they do not harm their neighbors or the environment. Um, the role of government is to enforce contracts and to provide a competitive free marketplace and to provide for the common defense of our country within our own borders and avoid foreign entanglements. And so it could be kind of summed up as don't hurt people and don't take their stuff. Pretty simple. And I believe the, the, the majority of Americans uh, share those values. So thank you. Thank you for that. I like that summary. Um, Lynn, I want to touch on something that you brought up, and this was this idea that people are coming out of the woodwork, you said, to support your party. I wonder if that also translates to candidates, and we'll get to each of you on this question, but how are you fielding candidates for, you know, there's a lot of opportunity with basically every seat in the state legislature up for a vote that, uh, you know, that could mean some turnover and some opportunities, especially for uh, parties who may not have been represented in the past. So how many races are you hoping to actually field a candidate for and, and, and have someone on the ballot? Uh, we, we will, our, our goal is to have a candidate in every seat. Um, and we do have prospects in almost all seats right now. Uh, this is probably the, um, the earliest that we have uh, we have had so many uh, prospective candidates, and we do also have committed candidates that are pulling and filing now. Um, and the way that we do it, actually, because of everything that is happening in our 
state right now and, and people just realizing that this is not, you know, the government has gotten to the point where the government is stepping in and trying to control, um, ha has too much control on our state and on our people, uh, that we're seeing people wanting to stand up and fight for the their individual rights or, or their businesses and their businesses closing down or whatever the situation may be. So we feel them by talking, by ask, looking, asking, and identifying, and we're finding way more interest than we have in the past. Um, so we have, a, again, like I said, we have a goal of filling every seat, and I believe that we're going to make that goal come June 7th. Jocelyn, same question. Um, I know that your you first your party first qualified. Uh, I, I know that you said at the outset you're the oldest party, but again, sort of had this um, reemergence, if you will, in the last few years. And in 2020 was the first year that you guys were back on the ballot. How many candidates are you hoping to field and or, or to put out there, and and how are you finding them? Uh, we're we're first wanting to send out that message that you have a voice. I think there's so much despair out there, um, watching people go to testify, watching people go to to tell them exactly how they want their Hawaii. And um, it seemed hopeful. There's a lot of people that participated in, in that venue of, of legislature and, and government, but then the result seems to be totally opposite. And so I think, especially with what we've, we've learned through the pandemic, and watching our Hawaii start to live again. And I'm speaking about the land. I'm speaking about the water. I'm speaking about the ocean and the air, how we, we had this dramatic change within the islands. I think we can now inspire people to come forward to speak to that type of Hawaii that we've been wanting. And then from there, we can grow. Instead of having something imposed upon us, that may not necessarily be as healthy for us, nor is it gonna be beneficial for the future. We're an island, we're not a continent. And so we need to have that mentality. And so one of the things that the Aloha Aina party is looking for in a candidate, and we really feel that there is gonna be this insurgent of, of just a lot of people now having the courage to stand up to the same old and, and create a new Hawaii and a new governance for this Hawaii. And so I, I have every confidence because you've seen the, the amount of people that come out when there is an issue that they really feel passionate about. And we're talking, these people, they, they've given up on government. They don't even want to vote, but they want their voices heard. So that's why we're opening up this lane for them to know that they have an opportunity to make the difference and the change that they're asking for. So I truly believe that um, through the Aloha Aina party, we can speak to each other face to face and come up with the same solutions. And, and I'm, I'm sad to say, but I'm, I'm grateful that the pandemic hit us in a way that had us pause. And now we can really look at, you know, we, we've been looking at, okay, what can the Aloha Aina party bring? What it bring, what we want to bring is unity. And the only way to bring unity is to find the thread that binds us all. It doesn't matter what party it is. It doesn't even matter where you live. We live here in this nation state of Hawaii. And so the, the main thing that we need to get across is land, water, and air. Any one of those things that disappear, none of us would be living here. We also need to know our land base. It's, it's um, limited to the island. So um, I am very hopeful these candidates will now find their way to have their voices heard. And now they, they're allowed through the Aloha Aina party to speak. Sylvia, I want to get to you. Um, you know, if you, when, when Lynn's talking about putting a candidate in hopefully every race, um, that seems like a pretty big hurdle uh, for, for any party other than the dominant Democrats right now. Um, do you, at, for the Green Party, do you sort of pick and choose uh, or target certain kinds of races or certain kinds of seats? How do you decide where to put the candidates that you have, the, the politicians that you have, given the limits that you have? And how many are you hoping to actually put on the ballot? That this season? Thanks. Well, we have uh, candidates interested in running for uh, State House, 
uh, governor. Uh, we have people interested in the Maui County Council races and the Hawaii Island races. And we would encourage people with green values to check out our website, look at our platform. And I love what Jocelyn was talking about. It takes courage to stand up for the people and the Aina. You want to give up hope. It just seems like it's all going towards the offshore interests. And we, we elect people who have the most money. And, and then we end up in this extraction economy where it's all about, you know, our resources being used up by multinational corporations and the people that we elect to represent us are, are overpowered by that type of money. So I, I do have hope that people will stand up and want to be a spokesperson for the land, for the Aina, for the people. Thank you. Eric, uh, what, what are you looking at this political season? How many candidates are you hoping to put on the ballot? Well, we've already had, uh, our party has already had a number of people file for uh, the U.S. Senate. Uh, we have two candidates, uh, Fina Bonanan and uh, Mike Kokoski. We have uh, the U.S. Representative in District 2, Michelle Tippins, as poll papers. For the governor, we have uh, T.K. Inshaw. Uh, we have uh, several state representatives that have polled, Candace uh, Linton in uh, District 4 and Michael Last in District 5. And we hope to have a number of other people that have expressed interest. Um, but I think I want to make an important point is, is that, uh, you know, we have had a, a one-party system in, in the state. And, and hearing tonight just so many shared values that I have, but I think the, the party in power has to take responsibility for the results. And it's nice to, to, to want to share these values. But I think if we keep putting the same people back in office and expecting different results, that's just unrealistic. And I think it's the definition of insanity. So uh, I hear a lot of shared values tonight. And I, I think most incumbents have to go in order for there to be real change. Well, Shannon, I think that's a good segue to you to give you an opportunity to respond since you are representing the dominant party. I would think that the Democrats actually could have the reverse problem where there'd be too many people uh, in some some districts, for instance, wanting to run for the same seat. How are you fielding your candidates? And also, I want to give you a chance to respond to Eric. Thank you so much. Yeah, let me start by responding to Eric. Um, and as I hear all of you talk, I, I do feel the passion that anybody who's stepping into this role of being the leader in a political party here in Hawaii is uh, doing so, I believe, with uh, obviously good intentions and, and hoping to make a difference and make a change. And, and that's sort of the role that we see ourselves in as Democrats. And, and yes, we get all of the all the flack and the feedback when things aren't going well in this position of um, political dominance, as we keep referring to it. Uh, but really, I, I see that more as a problem with uh, some of the reforms that we need. Um, and, and then, you know, Lynn pointed that out earlier um, in regards to some of the corruption charges at the state level. And those are reflective of those individuals and not of all of overall our, our elected leadership. And neither is that a reflection on our membership, um, who, again, we have such a diverse and, and compassionate membership for the most part. Uh, that we are working to try to hold our leadership accountable. And that's, and that's a real problem um, as far as uh, something that our, our membership works so hard on these resolutions and our party platform. And I've been there in the room working on these things that we all care about so much that I think almost all of the, the members on this panel right now would agree with me on. Um, but unfortunately, there's no real requirement for our elected leaders to support our platform. And, and maybe some of the other members on this panel could talk about how if their um, leaders, if their um, candidates were in charge, how they would hold them accountable to that platform. Uh, but really true accountability only comes from the public getting involved and our members need to stand up and ask for accountability from our elected officials. Otherwise our elected officials, especially those who haven't faced a challenger in many years um, and who have held office for a long time, with no term limits at the state level have very little incentive to truly uphold the ideals of our platform and of our resolution. And um, like you said, um, Yanji, there's uh, a lot of folks that are 
they're going to be competing against each other as Democrats in the primary. But one of the beautiful things about our membership is that we, at the end of the day, our Dems usually come together um, for the general election. And, and hopefully that'll be a time again for our um, membership to remind those in charge that, that we really do want them to be accountable to our party platform and our resolutions. I want to get to a viewer comment here. This is Fina on Facebook says, wow, I didn't realize how much the Constitution Party has in common with the Libertarian Party. So, Ed, I think that's a good segue to you. Uh, tell us a little bit about how many candidates you're hoping to uh, give voters a chance to vote for this uh, this season. Uh, thank you for, uh, for asking that question. Um, we are at this point, honestly, we are in the regrouping uh, stage, and uh, but we have spoken with quite a few people that are interested in running under the Constitution Party. But one of the interesting thing that I'm, I'm uh, that I hear all the time is uh, they, they say, "Well, Ed, you know, I'm I'm not satisfied with the two major uh, uh, two major parties." And I'm so glad that you guys are come along because at least you're giving us uh, a choice. And um, uh, and so this so they they ask us well, so what makes you so different from the rest of the parties, the poli especially with the with the two major ones. And you know the basic foundation for our party is that that. Uh, the source of this unalienable rights that we call, which is life, uh, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, it comes from the creator. This cannot be given, it cannot be sold, it cannot be finagled, it cannot be uh, uh, um, contracted. And when we use, when we have these two basic values together, it gives people hope. And this is what I'm finding out as I'm talking to people. Yes, they want to run for office. Yes, they're interested because for once in their life, they have something that that, that they can agree with, with the principles, with their conviction that they have. So we, we are in the process. It's very, very encouraging. We have a lot of feedback from a lot of people, uh, uh, but we are the uh, Johnny come lately. Uh, People are still finding out about us. Some some cannot even pronounce or or spell the name of our party. So how's that? Well, <laughs> well that's why that's why you're club. here tonight to to let people yes. know. Um, I wanna I wanna move along, and if you guys could all. If, if all of you could keep your uh, answers a little brief, because we are almost halfway through the show already, if you can believe it. But um, Lynn, this is a question for you, and I'm sure it comes up uh, about the former president. You know, he is the standard bearer of the party. Uh, and there are two questions here. Uh, one says, how much support does the Hawaii Republican Party have toward former President Donald Trump? And another one, do you believe that Donald Trump should be reelected if he runs for president again? You know, like I said, our, 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 our slogan for this year is focusing on 2022, which means that um, it's not a presidential election year. We want to make sure that Hawaii is first in this election and not get sidetracked by, uh, you know, what's happening across the nation, even though that's very important to us as well. Um, what I will say about those who support uh, President Trump and the party is that they're very passionate and many of them uh, uh, not only belong in the party, but they're here fueling our efforts at the party. Um, you know, now that especially, you know, President Biden is in office and uh, many in Hawaii are conservatives and we have actually three parties here that that are in support of conservative values. Um, and we believe that Hawaii is a conservative state in a lot of ways. Uh, and we believe that um, you know, we need to focus in on Hawaii, we need to focus in on the conservative values of our people. And we believe that a lot of the things that we're saying right here, even to the point of what Shannon is saying about the Democrat Party, those conservatives that are traditionally in the Democrat Party should be voting on the conservative side because we need a two party system here in Hawaii. So I would like to just have that message out to the conservatives that are in the Democrat Party, 
the conservative party, the libertarians, and you know we have uh, Aloha Aina uh, folks um, that are also inquiring about the Republican Party. Not to say that we want to pull away from any of the um, any of the other parties, their membership, but to say that when you have such a strong one-party system and a, mon a monopoly that is um, not in the good interest of the people of Hawaii. It's not the individual members of the Democrat Party. It is the inability to hold themselves accountable, as Shannon was mentioning earlier. So what we need is to come together as the rest of the parties to say that a one-party system is not okay. Shannon, I want to give you a chance to briefly respond to that. Uh, well, I guess I would say even the most conservative Democrats um, um, amongst us probably would not find themselves uh, joining a party that is is supportive of the vitriol of our of our past president. Um, I know that he was very divisive. Um, and again, I would like to focus on local politics as well. I agree with what Lynn's saying um, as far as 2022 is is the present. This is what we need to be focusing on. Uh, but I think most of our Democrats are united across the board in, in being very grateful for President Biden's leadership. While we may not agree with everything that he's doing overall, uh, he is, a, 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 I would say, a really welcome relief from the, the years of President Trump. Jocelyn, I want to give you an opportunity to answer this question from Pauline in IAEA. She says, how will you assure that the, uh, election, electing your party's candidates will not empower only Hawaiians, but all ethnicities? Um, how, is Aloha Aina a party just to represent Native Hawaiians, or can it represent those the rest of the community as well? I think that's what Pauline is asking. Thank you for that question. Um, I also belong to uh, the United Church of Christ. And one of the things that we're, we're working towards is living into that apology. And what I had found through the conversation in that, that um, issue of living into the apology of the overthrow of 1893 is that it stops when it becomes a Hawaiian thing. It, and it, we, should, we should really look at what the issue is. It's a thing of justice. It's a thing of doing the right, doing what is right. And that's what we're calling for. We're calling for people that want to stand up. If you even look at that Kuei petition in 1893, it wasn't just Hawaiians that were signing. It was everyone who felt what was wrong was wrong and what needs to be right, be corrected. And so the Aloha Aina Party, again, stands for um, uniting people under this the one thread that binds us which is our resources land water and air and the way you do it is a, a four step we first have to humble ourselves we have to come back to really realize what is important here and it's not even a party we have to look at hawaii once we do that then we can spiritually connect to what we need to do and at that point and that's that, that the first one was called ha, ha, ha. The next one is la, la, la. So we now become um, spiritually connected. We have this, this connection. Then we go into ma'a, ma'a, which would be that we can now know our place, our kuleana, and we can take care of what we really, truly, truly need to do. Once we can accomplish those four things, la, 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 ha, 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 ha. I mean, sorry, ha, 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 ha la, 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 ma'a, ma'a. Now we can turn to pa'a. Now we can really get down to business. We can really take care of our, our Hawaii. We can really look to, towards a, a bright future. And to, to say that, you know, um, Hawaii is not progressive back in the day, you, you got to realize the palace had lights way before, you know, the continent. We had flushing toilets. We had telephones. Um, we had all the we were progressive. He, our king probably would have had a laptop way before um, other countries would have had it. So I really believe that um, it's a people thing. I, I can't do this by myself. And I'm not going to just say that only a Hawaiian knows how. That would be ludicrous. Yeah. But we do live in Hawaii. And so we need to let the voices of Hawaii speak.
for the land, the water, and the air. Okay. Uh, Sylvia, I want to bring in this question. Uh, a viewer is asking, what are the significant differences of the Green Party of Hawaii from the two major political parties? Who would you say? Well, again, I think the main difference is that we're independent from large big money donations. And, uh, you know, actually tonight, I'm very inspired by our similarities that are being represented here. And, uh, you know, so many things that everyone is talking about here, uh, the values are very similar. And uh, part of the green philosophy is that we are all connected. And I think what connects us here in Hawaii is very powerful. We have the most beautiful place and the most precious resources. And I just feel like let's all get together after this show. Let's all get together, get to know each other, find our common ground. And, you know, it's great for all of us to have voices and third parties are important. And at the same time, build coalitions and where can we be unanimous in moving forward to really do something powerful for Hawaii's future? And I know all of us here feel passionate about that. Well, I want to see the video of the follow-up. Eric, I want to go to you. Um, can you tell us a little bit about when you look at the landscape? You know, we've talked about, uh, their, their Kayla on Instagram says, no more majority of Democrats. We need more balance in politics. Uh, I'm sure that that is something that your party uh, is working on. When you look at the way politics unfolds in our state, why do we need more choice? Well, <laughs> that's a really good question. Um, the the answer is that the, the party in power has to take responsibility for the, the results, not what they promise and want to help people, but the results. So let's take the $88 billion of uh, unfunded liabilities in the state for future pensions. That's $60,000 per man, woman, and child, or for a family of four, it's a quarter million dollars that they've indebted every a citizen of Hawaii. Let's take the rail system that's now gonna cost $13 billion to, uh, that it may or may not even happen. These are real consequences. And we talk about homeless pro problems or fixing the land. And as long as that level of, of really extracting wealth from the citizens uh, to those in power. It, it, we have to stop this. And the only way to do it, and I love the idea, I was, I'm amazed at the similarities between the parties and their value system. And I, I will very much uh, like to get together afterwards because it's going to take all of us united. And I think that the, when I hear the, the, the the representatives speak about the Democratic Party. I actually believe that the majority of citizens of the Democratic Party are with us as well. The trouble is when you have that much power, it just becomes corrupt. It's just the nature of things. So um, we need to have a, a great awakening um, and get back to the Constitution and individual rights um, and I think we all share that value. So I'm, I'm stoked that you got us all together tonight. <laughs> and uh, we may actually be able to create a movement that, uh, that represents the, the mom and pop, the ordinary citizen of Hawaii that is sick and tired of, of these poor results and being fleeced. Ed, what so, about that idea of... Question. of Ed, what about that idea of joining forces? There was that comment earlier, I've lost it now in the shuffle, but that said that they're, they're, they were the viewer was surprised to notice how much your party had in, in, uh, in, in common with Eric's. What about this idea of third parties, instead of there being six of you on the screen right now, what about there being fewer of you and, and finding more uh, common ground and uniting in that way? What are your thoughts on that? Well, I am also amazed that we have basically the same value. And I like what Eric said. That's, you know, I, I look at the Constitution Party as a mom and pop store, you know, the basic, uh, uh, basic uh, uh, concept, it's the Constitution. And 
regardless of whether we are running for a national uh, office or on the local level, the Constitution is the foremost, the most important law of the land. We cannot mess with it. And what's been happening is we have messed with it. And that's why we have such a, a chaotic society today, because we've gotten away from the rationality, uh, the rational concept that our forefathers, our founding fathers have created. It is worked for the last over 200 years and it's gonna work for the next 200 years if we stick to uh, 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 defending the, uh, uh, the constitution, the Bill of Rights, and of course, understanding that there's a creator behind all of this. And he gave it to us. The creator gave it to us so we can enjoy life, the life of the pursuit of happiness. Lynn, I want to get to this question to you from Laakea on Maui. Um, and it says, on this day of transgendered visibility, along with Republican-led don't say gay legislation throughout the U.S., what are the stances of the conservatives on the panel uh, when it comes to LGBTQ rights? I know that you want to focus um, not necessarily on national politics, but this is something, obviously, uh, that sure. interests this viewer, and, and I'd like to get your thoughts. Well, actually, that is not a, only a national issue. It's a local issue. There were two bills that were moving through the legislature, uh, moving through the state house that had to do with um, making, basically, it was a parental rights issue when you're talking about the LGBT community. And I have no problem saying gay. I think that was so misconstrued on how that uh, bill was uh, labeled as a don't say gay uh, bill. Um, locally, what is happening is uh, you have two bills that are, are, like I said, an assault on parental rights. When you have children who are um, maybe thinking about, in fact, not even thinking about sexual uh, uh, involvement or sexuality issues at a very young age, and you're having uh, the, the public, the schools, the government, replacing the position on a very sensitive issue um, that parents should be the people who actually are the ones who are counseling their children. And you're taking away that right from good parents who have to close, clothe their children, um, feed them, you know, take care of their uh, uh, everyday concerns and issues within a, a, a child's life. And to say that you want to you know, take away those rights of, of parents by circumventing the, the, the parents' ability to um, talk to their children about this, this particular issue um, is to me what is another issue that makes, you know, a lot of folks up in arms about government coming in and saying, you know, we want to uh, we want to take over the parents' responsibility in issues such as these. And I think that that's why it's so important for us to at least, you know, if there was something that said with a, with parental uh, opting in for counseling or or something like that, um, then there would be at least the ability for parents to understand what's going on with their children and be the first ones to be able to, um, you know, be involved in that child's life. And that's, you know, people are just getting really fed up about government coming in and saying what they can and cannot do with, you know, with the way that they raise their children. Shannon, um, that's a big issue uh, for whole... many of the people. Thank you. I, I think we could probably do a whole show on, on this topic. Um, and, you know, it harkens back. There was this debate a few years ago about Pono choices, and I hear a lot of the same things. But Shannon, I want to give you, give you an opportunity to briefly lay out where the Democrats stand on that issue. Thank you. I think there's a lot actually I'd love to respond to if we had more time. Um, some of what Eric was saying earlier, too, I think might be important to go back to. Uh, but just to stick with this topic at hand for a moment, um, our, our Democratic Party is, again, one of inclusivity, and we are absolutely in support of trans rights. And um, and for me personally, I have some dear friends um, who their children are, are kind of struggling with their identity right now and they're, they're going through some of this. So it's a very real uh, issue in, in my life personally and, and something that um, 
I, I always want to see that those children are supported and getting the, the care that they need. I feel like there might be some misunderstanding about um, those bills. And um, I, yeah, I, I just, I'm, the way I'm hearing it represented, I, I don't think there's ever been any push to take away parental rights. So I, I feel like this is kind of one of those things that is getting off of um, off subject and a, a little bit being misconstrued. Um, I think overall, it's always about the, the safety of the children first and making sure that those kids who need support are getting the support that they deserve. Um, so overall, I would say um, the Democratic Party is 100% in support of LGBTQ uh, rights and, and um, absolutely stands with our trans friends and, and family members. I know it's hard to pick just one issue for each of your parties um, because the state is facing so much when we look at economic recovery, tourism, COVID, uh, you know, mitigation, because the virus is still with us, uh, TMT comes to mind. There are just a, a myriad of issues facing our state, but I'd love to go around just brief, we'll call it a lightning round, as lightning as we can be on this panel, uh, and, and ask you, you know, what is the number one issue for your party and why do you think that you're best suited to address that? And, and Sylvia, let's start with you. Thank you. Hawaii needs a Green New Deal, a Hawaiian Green New Deal, where we rebuild the economy and regenerate the land at the same time. And uh, like what was earlier mentioned about supporting small businesses, one of the most important small businesses we can support is small farms. So we can move towards food sovereignty. Right now we're taking 90%, uh, almost 90% of our food is being imported and we do very little for the small farmers and, and that is the growing segment of agriculture. Um, gone are the days of the monocropping and the big plantations and we need to help transition into a more sustainable uh, way of doing our agriculture and producing our own food and actually feeding our own people. Okay, Jocelyn, what about you? What do you think is the number one issue and why is your party best suited to address it? Um, well, there's three, like I said, it's land, water, and air, and it all connects together. You know, we've got these uh, big corporations gobbling up what they consider TMKs, but yet our people are talking about their land titles. And they go all the way back, you know, in, in Hawaii, you know, we always say you look to your past to find your future. And a lot of them are now researching and wanting to get into um, the Kanavai, the laws of Hawaii, and how their lands were, um, all of a sudden, not their lands anymore. And with the lands come the rights to the water. With the water comes the rights to life, which is is to be able to feed yourself, to produce and to feed your, your, your neighbors and the elderly and the young ones who cannot yet. And so I think for us, you know, we need to look at, um, we need to go back and really study what the Kanavai is telling us. And if, if it is in line with what Hawaii means. And, and the Kanawai is law. Yeah, it's it's law. But I think that the land, water, and air, and a lot of the land titles that are in question, um, I think is important. A, a lot of the people, you know, are, are looking towards that. And I'm, I'm not saying to go and look for land to kick people out. Go and look for land to make sure everything is correct. Okay. So, um, well, Eric, let's I go to let's go to you now. Um, my guess would be fi fiscal responsibility from the other issues that you laid out. But what do you think is the most important issue, and why are the libertarians that the is, best party that to do is it? That is important as well as transparency in government. Um, it, you know, when uh, we should know who's got the contracts, and and should just be open book and transparent. That's a problem. But I want to talk a little bit about farming and and self sustainability. Um, the the uh, governor, I remember going to one of his meetings beforehand and, and talking about, well, we need to make the island more self-sufficient so, so we can feed ourselves. But I've been in agriculture for 40 years and the amount of government regulations is driving farmers out of business. And so fewer, you look at the population and it's all older folks, no younger people can get into it. And so we've been just burdened by these unnecessary regulations and it's driving small businesses out. So I love the fact that we're talking about clean air, clean water, 
um, and, and the land, because that is what is going to sustain Hawaii. And it, those are really important. So we've got to um, focus on that. Right now, the, the Democratic Party was in charge. It uh, allocates less than 1% of the budget towards agriculture. And how can you have someone say that we want to be self-sustaining and more reliant on ourselves for food when you can grow food all year long in Hawaii and only allocate 1%? I mean, I, it, the list goes on. I, I, I was told both by a United States senator and a, a local um, representative of the House, on, and I was in an ag meeting, that you've got to pay to play. That's how corrupt the system is. They're telling me to my face in a public meeting that you've got to pay to play. We need to get together and demand our state back. This is, it, it's outrageous. We're going to crumble unless we change who we have in power. Okay. And what would you say is the number one issue for your party? Well, I can only speak for myself as a representative of the Constitution Party here in Hawaii. But the number one issue for me would be the, the moral issue of uh, the right to life. And, uh, you know, for the last 30 or so odd years, we have murdered over 50 million babies. I can't even begin to fathom uh, the incredible tragedy that comes out of it. And uh, Constitution Party, we are against abortion, and we believe that. And as far as the local level is concerned, that would be my number one issue, the moral issue of abortion. Okay. Lynn, let's go to you representing the Republicans. What is the number one issue? I know there are so many issues, but why, what is the number one issue and why do you think the Republicans are the best party to take it on? Angie, you're right. There's so many issues, uh, but I will say that accountability is the big issue right now. Uh, I think that's a, a theme of tonight, that a one-party system cannot go unchallenged, and it has been. Um, and to what Shannon said earlier, you know, back in the 50s, uh, you had the Democrats being the reform party of Hawaii. I believe that the Republicans are now the reform party of Hawaii. We need to come in and stop the Democrats from being the monopoly. They are our government. They are responsible for all of the results, as Eric was saying earlier, uh, that we have today. Uh, we can do better. We need change. We need people to, uh, uh, to stand up, stand for, uh, what Hawaii and what I believe is of many of our conservative values, uh, no matter what party you're a part of. Um, and, and that is something that accountability and a two-party system, and, and I would even say minimally a two-party system, you know, here in Hawaii, uh, that we will be able to make changes, but let's, you know, it, the, the time of now, the time is now, um, and we can't let one more election cycle go by with this one party system unaccountable to Hawaii's people. Shannon, obviously, I have to let you respond. There were a number of uh, points brought up that sort of target the Democratic Party. Of course, I want to get also to the question of what do you think the number one issue is and why the Democrats are best suited to solve it? Thank you. Yeah, actually, uh, going back to Eric again, um, He's, he's got it out for me, but I just wanted to say when he mentioned um, that, uh, you know, that there's no young farmers, um, just how much his son, Drake, has inspired. Um, he is a young farmer and he's inspired uh, myself and, and my husband to, to do the farming that we do. And, and I heard the first two panelists mention environment and, and growing our own food as well. And so I, I personally, that's something that I think is really crucial that we need to focus on. Um, but going on to the some of the other topics that keep getting brought up, the accountability, um, as I mentioned earlier, that's something that our party is struggling with. And we have a convention coming up, um, and that's at the end of May. So it would be great to get all of our members who are passionate about reform within our party to join us at that convention. Um, and, and they can find out more about our convention on our website at dphconvention.com. Um, but the big issue that is driving our party right now that's getting a lot of people motivated to do some of this grassroots work that again we don't get much credit for these days but a lot of the 
um, incremental changes that we've had um, and the large changes, um, labor reform, social support networks, um, environmental reforms and protections that we have here in Hawaii, we have our, our hard work um, and persistence of our Democratic Party members to thank for that. And, and one example of, of an issue that's coming up now is the living wage issue. Uh, Democrats, we really believe that $15 an hour is a bare minimum in our fight towards a living wage. Um, many of our party members have been working hard and organizing for years, pushing for at least $18 by 2026. Um, and even that would still be uh, a poverty wage um, based on our rising cost of living here in Hawaii. Um, so I think that's probably the issue that overall many Democrats right now would say is important to them and that they would like to see a change this legislative session on, um, again, while all those other issues are, are so important too. Okay, well, mahalo to all of you for joining us tonight. We do thank our guest, Eric Weinert from the Libertarian Party of Hawaii, Shannon Matson from the Democratic Party of Hawaii, Sylvia Litchfield of the Green Party of Hawaii, from the Constitution Party of Hawaii, Ed Gassman, Lynn Finnegan from the Hawaii Republican Party, and Jocelyn Costa from the Aloha Aina Party. Next week on Insights, it was six years ago when Governor David Ige first floated the idea of building a new jail on Oahu to replace an aging and overcrowded OCCC, but over the the years, there's been a lot of back and forth with concerns about planning, design, and of course, the money to pay for it all. So where does the project stand right now? Please join us next week to find out. I'm Yanchi Denise for Insights on PBS Hawaii. Aloha.